Good morning, baseball fans. I say good morning. Good afternoon, baseball fans. It is Sunday, the 23rd of April. This is episode 20, season two of Bourbon and Baseball. This is Susie. Guess what? We got Shelby on. Woohoo! And we have a very, very special guest today, Gary Sheffield Jr. Some of y'all might know him. I don't, you know, he's, he, he's, a, he's a pretty big deal. We like him. Um, we're very, very thankful that you agreed to come on the show, Gary. Um, we are thrilled that Shelby slid into your DMs again. Um, and at some point, Shelby, you will have to tell me your secret sauce because I, my feelings are a little hurt because I slide into people's DMs and no one answers me. So um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's me. Maybe I don't have I need to get, I need to get some crack. special magic because I'm really trying to get a big leaguer. The one that I, I've, I've kind of, I had to back off of was like Fergie Jenkins, right? Love him. Awesome pitcher. Um, can't get a response from him, man. I'm a little sad. Is he, is he about to take a restraining order out on you or like, do, you know, do I don't think it's worried? got, it hasn't gotten that bad yet. I don't, okay. I don't okay. think, you know, there's boundaries, you know, there's okay. boundaries. So I, mean, I didn't know, I, if, I, I didn't know I, if you were sending him feet pictures or anything like, I, you know, there's no money involved there yet. So right. we'll okay. see. Right. Let me hop on the feet finder and then we'll figure it out. Gotcha. Okay. But, um, man, Gary Sheffield Jr. Thank you so much. Do you go by chef? You go by chef Jr.? Actually, my family calls me Little Gary because <gasps> they'll say Gary and mo- me and my dad will turn our heads. So I'm Little Gary. <laughs> that's little amazing. Gary. That's, yeah. That's yeah. perfect. But man, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to try really hard not to talk too much about your dad because your dad was like one of my absolute <laughs> idols. It's the only Yankees gear I've ever owned was your dad's jersey. But I'm just going to say that your dad should be in the Hall of Fame. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm sure you've heard that a lot. But uh, unbelievable I swing. Agree. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree. Um, but yeah, man, we, you know, we started this podcast um, kind of nitty gritty. Um, we really wanted to show our personalities because we're kind of that, um, I guess you would say kind of grunt females, you know, we, we don't have filters. We're not really into the whole, you know, showing cleavage on screen and all that kind of stuff. But we just want to we want to watch baseball. We want to talk in about person? it. Is that what you're saying, Shelby? We're not, we're not willing to, what, what, the way that you phrase that, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think, I think. I agree with I, what you're, where you're going with that though. <laughs> I agree with that. Cause it almost feels like you either have to be a man to be in this space or you have to be this bimbo blonde that shows your boobs. That's not the case. Women Gosh, can Susie, cover Susie this game. Just... You can do it. And frankly, I don't, I don't mind if someone wants to show cleavage and cover the game of baseball, it's not going to, I'm not going to get upset. I'm a man. Yeah. Well, but, no, no, more power to him. I'm just, yeah. I'm mad that I don't, that I don't have any. Cause if I had some, <laughs> you cut, y'all couldn't stop me. Okay. Like, right. I would be the most popular baseball podcaster ever, ever. Right. Just no, nothing could, could hold me back. Uh, side note, Shelby said kind of hinted towards the whole unfiltered thing if this is the first time you guys are tuning into Berman and baseball you should probably know that we are a little bit rated r um we say the cuss words we do the inappropriate adult humor um currently we're not drinking but most of the time there's alcohol so if that's not your jam totally okay uh but probably not the podcast for you maybe maybe you should take your small children and not listen to to it maybe you know headphones i don't know i'm not going to judge you however um because I do have a funny story about tiny children and our podcast, Shelby, but I'll save that for a little, for another time. But uh, again, there's your warning. When you hear the F-bombs, when you hear the cuss words and the in- inappropriate adult humor, don't uh, don't say that we didn't warn you. There you go. We always throw the disclaimer in there because, uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> we get some new listeners and they don't really know what they're in for. But um, so, uh, Gary, tell us a little bit. A little about, uh, about your background, kind of what you do, um, just in case some people don't know. Um, well, so I always knew I wanted to be in this, right? The podcasting space. Podcasting is really fun for me personally, because I feel like I really got my break on Twitter and that there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem with Twitter, and I'm sure you both can agree, is that people can misunderstand you very quickly and very easily on that platform. It's not a place for nuanced takes. You're not going to say, someone's not going to tell you, let's ban the shift. Well, someone might have a compelling argument as to why they think that you should be able to ban the shift and someone else might have some point 
to make as to why you shouldn't do it. Well, on Twitter, you just really see someone's conclusion and then you just walk off. You see someone's conclusion, you retweet the conclusion that you agree with or disagree with. And if you disagree, people will usually quote tweet you and say, this guy sucks or she sucks and leave. That's Twitter. Well, I got popular in that space. And frankly, it's a little frustrating because when I get on podcasts, people say, wow, you know what? You really turned out to be different than what we thought you were. You were a little more sophisticated. We may not, we didn't agree with what you said, but we understand why you said what you said. That is something strictly for podcasts. Only podcasters can really get away with that. And I was actually forced to write because I was hired at this company called Outkick, which is essentially this, I'm a libertarian. I'm like right in the middle politically, but they were like, we need you to be like this right wing writer and that'll bridge you into your podcasting career. And at the time I wasn't making any money. Like I know a popular belief is that I'm rich because my dad is incredibly wealthy. It's not the case. My dad didn't throw money my way. I don't really care if somebody else has a parent that makes them rich or whatever. That's their business, but that's not my upbringing. So I needed money. So I did the job, wrote about politics for a while, and eventually veered into the sports field. And I realized that I like podcasting a lot much, a lot better, really, than writing. Writing for me was very nerdy, and it just wasn't <laughs> my thing. I wanted to be on camera. So now that I've done that. I'm starting to bridge into being a full-time podcaster. We built this whole studio. We're getting better equipment. And it's it's really fun. And as you guys, I'm sure, can agree, podcasting, if we could do this all full-time and do nothing else, we would do that. That's the dream. That's the dream. That's yeah. the dream. If, if I could sit here and talk shit every day and get paid for it, I th yeah, I would definitely do it. <laughs> but, but, but no, and, and then that, that, that's something I think that um, – um, you know, we talked about a little bit earlier before we started recording is that um, there's something about being on camera with the people on your show and having disagreeing views and being able to respect the space and do it for right. entertainment at the same time. Um, that's the most fun, because I'll tell you what, some me and Susie, there's some things, especially when it comes to Astros baseball, we do not agree with like Martin Maldonado, right. which we will. You know, and but but you know we're going to talk about it. Our views don't change, but you know we still hop on here and have a great time. So I mean, I think it you ended up like in a perfect space with our show, right? Because we have the exact same views. Um, I do want to talk to um, this. I thought this was really, really, really awesome, um, and I really want to bring this site to life because I think it's so important and I think it's perfect. Um, that we bring you on this week to kind of talk about MLBbro.com um, to celebrate the the black and brown players in the MLB. Um, and some of those guys are absolutely shining right now. Like we just saw Adolis Garcia, right? Um, mm -hmm. Went absolutely nuts. Three bombs, two doubles, five for five. Um, and then you did a take on YouTube about Hunter Green. That guy is unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I love Hunter Green. Susie does He's love so Hunter fun. Green. Gosh, I've been on the Hunter amazing. Green since like last year. Okay. Like I, before it was cool Before people wanted to be on the, on the Hunter Green train. Like I was there. I was there. I want, I need, I need credit. I need credit, Shelby. Don't yeah. She definitely, she definitely was when, uh, <laughs> when, uh, we got on a Reds train for a little while last year when Hunter Green came up and then like, I love Joey Votto. I'm a huge Joey Votto fan, but, um, um, can you kind of talk about that website and, and kind of how it came about and then what it means to you? Cause it's gotta be pretty special to be a part of something like that. Yeah, it is special. And for me, instead of, because a lot of times when you say that minorities and you, you try to figure out why black people aren't playing baseball as much as they were, say, 20 years ago, rather than spending my time complaining about it, what I'd rather do is use my platform and help grow black players that are currently there. Because I figure the only way that you can effectively impact black players in the game of baseball is simply by showing how good they are and rather than complaining. And that's what I've done. I realize that over time, people don't respond well to complaining. It just doesn't work. 
the spending time protesting and, and trying to create rules and regulations as to why I should want, I want more black people, people that look like me in the game of baseball. Would I prefer that? Of course. But rather than complaining, I'll join a network like MLB Bros. Rob Parker brought me on from Fox Sports. And we talk about the good that's happening around the league. And it's people are responding to it well. That's a good thing. So in my mind, if someone does something like Hunter Green, who he's faced some really tough teams so far this year, he's faced Atlanta, he's faced a, a few teams that I'm like, Philadelphia, some tough lineups. And he pitched really well his last time out. I'm sitting there looking at him like, okay, if I cover this guy with my platform that's continuing to grow, you guys are going to cover him, I'm sure. He'll be a household name. Now, if a household name looks like Hunter Green, why do I need to sit there and lecture people about why black people need to play baseball? Someone who's black will probably decide themselves, I want to go play that. And that's ultimately what our mission is. Tell me he's as nice as I, as, as he seems to be. Like he seems to be like that kind of down to earth, kind of yeah, super awesome, chill guy. And I love that his mom had Hunter's mom on her jersey when, they, when he signed his extension. Yeah. No, he's as nice as you think he is and maybe nicer. He's like the Larry Fitzgerald of baseball. He feels like he's 40 when you meet him. <laughs> he's like a 40-year-old man, which is a good thing. Like he's, he's very well spoken. Very, very, very well spoken. Like, he's yeah, a ton of wisdom. As young as he is, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's impressive. And I have a feeling that by the time he's 25, 30, 35 in the game of baseball, when he's on his way out, he'll probably be doing what Tony Clark's doing right now, trying to be the commissioner. He'll do something like that. That's that's amazing. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset if Hunter Green was the commissioner of MLB, but you know, yeah, I'm sure I, we I all need have to, I need to throw I need to throw him I need him to throw a few more seasons though before that happens. So just I would probably go scoring yeah. now. Anything's better than Rob Manfred, but anyways, this is true. There's my political view of the day, <laughs> but no, I mean, like, I, and I think that's awesome. Like, we're seeing some some unbelievable guys come up right now. Jordan Walker. Right. The, the, that, that guy is unreal. Um, but there's so many people to celebrate. Like I think about some of my heroes, like your dad, King Griffey Jr., Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz. Like those are the guys that I watched on TV. I really honestly, I don't think I can. I mean, besides obviously Jeff Bagwell and Craig Biggio, because they were in my hometown. You know, I looked up to those guys and, and I really honestly didn't think about that. Um, until I started looking at MLB bros, I I was thinking about what y'all were trying to do, um, and kind of your mission. And I'm like, you know what, like there needs to be more push for this and there needs to be celebration of this because I did, I celebrated those guys when I was younger. Um, so I think, I think that's really special. And I know that means a lot to me. You know, I I taught, um, at an underrepresented school that was primarily African-American and I know that means the world to that community and it it means the world to our community and to the baseball community. So I just wanted to give some props to that. And I definitely wanted to talk about that on here because um, I I hope that gets some listeners for you guys. um, And so that people can see, you know, that is going on behind the scenes. So um, man, that's awesome. Um, Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, instead of talking about like the negative stuff about it, we just figured in, To be honest with you, this isn't really a black issue or a black success story. The way I look at it is that all these different cultures, whether it's Japanese, you you watch the World Baseball Classic, you see the Dominican Republic and you see the flair that they play with. Mm -hmm. Well, here in America, I played baseball in America. We didn't play like that. That's not the atmosphere that we're used to. Well, it doesn't mean our atmosphere stinks, but sometimes other cultures do provide you it, yeah, you you could you could <laughs> potentially does. draw that conclusion. It's very boring. But to be clear, baseball here in America, we play the way we play because of all the unwritten rules of baseball. Yeah. Yeah. We're the ones we're the ones doing that. Men have to be covering. Old white guys have to be covering the game. And if you hit a home run, you need to put the bat down. You need to sprint. Maybe not sprint, but get it moving around the bases. Yeah, that's a predominantly American mentality. Well. The people who want to really fit into that mold, well, it's not going to be a guy from the Dominican. 
who's been raised to play the game a different way where he pu he puts his heart on his shoulder he's gonna he's going to he is going to show you exactly who he is on the baseball field that's a good thing and now that you come here rather than complaining about today's culture i'd rather celebrate their culture and then when you get here you feel like i've put you in a position to show yourself and once you've done that baseball is going to be in a much better position and we didn't have to complain our way to get there i think that's i, think, I like that you um brought that up because we had a big conversation about this when the world baseball classic came out because it was a blast i mean like you're sitting there you're like what over in a um in japan they have like music playing they have dancers on the dugout mm -hmm. the whole game and i'm like i could not imagine but like look at a guy like reese hoskins right reese hoskins hits the home run slams the bat down everybody was well i was not but anyways um you know slams the bat down but nobody really not that i can really think of dog beam for it right but right. then we go back and, and we look at the uh, joey bats you know the historical bat flip right Mm -hmm. for the blue jays uprising right it, people were just absolutely losing their minds over that but yeah i i would love to see a culture change in baseball because i don't think the game can grow without it but i think it's slowly getting implemented um and i slowly it's starting to become a little more accepted people are celebrating the bat the bat flips and uh you know things of that nature but um i, I I personally love it. I love seeing personalities. Um, I love seeing guys like Ronald Acuna Jr. I think he brings so much personality to the game of baseball. That's exciting to me. That's fun to watch. Like right now, um, we talked about this last week, the home run celebrations right now. Everybody's on board with the freaking home run celebrations. That's love what makes baseball fun. Yes. Yeah, it's true. You can do whatever you want now. Pretty you much. We used to have an, like a really a huge issue where if someone saw a celebration, our expectation was to see someone get hit the very next batter. That's that's not. And then someone would say, yeah, that's what we should have done. OK, well, then the people saying that have no desire for new people to come into the game. Right. You can't tell me that you have a desire for this game to grow if everything has to stay the same. It just doesn't work that way. Some things have to stay the same, but, and you, you have to maintain what the game of baseball is and it has to be recognizable. But if the game has stayed the same, if 50 years from now you can watch a game and it looks pretty much exactly the way it looked when you were a kid, something went wrong. Right. I don't know who's to blame, whether it's the commissioner and in this space where we're podcasters and we're all now millions of people can see what we say. If you aren't saying that the game needs to change in some way as a podcaster or somebody with any type of power, I don't know what you're doing with your platform. I don't know. We can disagree all day long about how the game should change, but if there's no changes on the table, like people being able to play with flair, I don't know what it is you're here for right. so yeah i've always i've always been a i've always been front row to see some changes in the game of baseball some of the changes i agreed with like the pitch count and or disagreed with the, like the pitch count or whatever but the fact that there are changes being made to game of baseball and we're getting accustomed to seeing personality that's fantastic oh yeah when when we did our um when we did our episodes <clears throat> on the pitch clock and how you know, our thoughts and uh, on that and whatnot, we had, well, not, not so much Shelby. I feel that a lot of pitch clock disclaimers on, on social media. And I, I was like, we're just, I'm going to just call it, call it like it is. Y'all are just curmudgeons. That's just, that's what's happening here. That's so for, for a little while there, I just hashtagged everything curmudgeon and that's what it was <laughs> in reference to. So Shelby, what do you think about the pitch clock? So I actually pitched in college, and so uh, I kind of I honestly can't even remember what my take was because I'm so used to it now. I'm like, whatever. Um, right. But my my big thing was so I was fortunate enough to um, – I wasn't a PO, so I did a little bit of everything, and I got to hit too. And I think what I was most nervous about is, you know, pitchers get in a rhythm and they get in a routine, 
And with your one time out and at bat, um, it, it really kind of kills that opportunity. I think that's a part of the game, right? That's a big mental part of the game, killing routine, killing time. Um, right. Pitchers get into patterns, right? Um, that gives pitchers an opportunity. Um, but I think it kind of – I was really nervous about it taking the bat out of the batter's hand. But it's ever-changing right now. People are getting used to it. We're seeing – it seems like we're seeing less violations in the box. Um, I think the biggest thing as for pitchers was we we actually talked about um, injuries, right? Um, you know, we've seen some guys that get called like right in the middle um, of their windup. Gosh, that's I mean that's terrifying. Yeah, um, that's foolish. Yeah, I don't I don't <laughs> care for that. That makes me nervous. But um, I mean, I, I feel like I've kind of adapted as a fan. I don't necessarily hate it as much as I did. I think what I hated most about it was it was a forced change. Um, there were, it was a forced change, trying to change the culture, trying to change the pace. That's what I didn't like. I, I feel like the game should just kind of evolve itself. Okay. That's where we argued. Because I was like, shut up, Shelby. It's here. We love well, it. Yeah, I mean, I played baseball as well. I was just a hitter. I was a center fielder, leadoff hitter, the speed guy. And yeah, pitchers, pitchers do get into a rhythm. And I remember any type of pitcher really was doing well, hit, maybe an assistant coach would come up to me and say, slow the game down, do something, step out the box. He's in too good of a rhythm. You need to slow this game down. You need to do something. And it, it was basically the equivalent to being a boxer and grabbing someone. You're not really abiding by the rules, but that's where baseball, I don't know if I can call it beauty, but that's part of the game is that you can dirty up the game a little bit. Yeah. Well, baseball's changed that. They're trying to polish the game, and I feel like it was a good change that I didn't like, I guess I can say. Mm -hmm. I agree with the change, that, but I didn't like it. And the, I'll explain it this way. I enjoyed being at the field for five hours. I did. But I also completely understand why someone like my fiance, who I took to her first game last June at Yankee Stadium, she looked at me dead in my face. I asked her, how'd you like the game? She said it fucking sucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. It sucked. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and awesome. I, can't, I can't argue against you because you have to keep in mind as a baseball fan, the three of us here love the game of baseball. We can spend all day at a spring training game. We can go get a frozen drink, but maybe get maybe a little little frozen vodka drink, enjoy ourselves, sit out on the lawn, and be there for the foreseeable future, and then go out to dinner and go home. We are happy. It is that simple. Maybe we'll just even eat at the stadium and go home and be elated. But you have to be aware, new people in the game of baseball, there's nothing new in the world today that interests me that takes five hours. There's nothing. If there's anything new for all of us here, it is some show on Netflix or Amazon Prime. And that show is an hour tops. And if it's a longer than an hour, you usually look to your side and look at your partner and say, how damn long is this show? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Gary, I don't know. Um, I, I was not a fan of baseball before 2018. Okay. So before 2018, I was just a big black hole of baseball knowledge. My husband loves baseball. I take that back. Loved baseball. Now he's, now he's tired of me talking about baseball to him. Um, but 2017 world series, Alex Bregman, hits the walk off. I fell asleep in game five on the couch he had to wake me up screaming telling me about this i'm all i don't i don't know what that means like you said words that individually i know but then you'd strung them all together and i don't, I don't know what that means what what so i feel your fiance i understand her frustration because it was my frustration for a long time yeah he would try and get me to watch baseball games i'm all what why why is that why is that a thing and for the long well not for the longest time for a little while there i thought that the shortstop was short because it was shortstop, like Jose Altuve. I thought Jose Altuve was the shortstop at, at one time, and I was like, "What? Yep. What?" And then was just blown away that it's not an actual thing. 
And the and then the rule and you try to explain. Well, there's rules within the rules within the game. I'm all don't just stop. That's not. I don't. I don't like that. Nope. Mm -mm. It nope. was almost. It's almost like the people that like the game of baseball who are like, oh, there's all this the game inside the game and all these like like you just said. Yeah. All these like cliches. It's like the saying of the book was better than the movie. Like all those people, <laughs> you look dumb. It it doesn't it doesn't make you seem sophisticated saying yeah. baseball is this like this thinking man's game and all that stuff. Like you're not gonna get someone new to watch the game of baseball with that garbage slogan. Yeah. Just tell people you need to give it a chance. Just watch it. It's like telling someone by season two and three of a show, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I would describe baseball. If you watch it right off rip, this game sucks. It's boring. You're 99% of the time you're going to look at the screen. Nothing will happen. Absolutely nothing. And how do you sell that product to somebody who doesn't understand the game? You need to tell them disclaimer. This is going to take a while. Yeah. Get comfortable. This is, that's, that's, that's the way my children like to watch the game. There's, I have seven year old uh, identical girl twins and one of them loves, loves baseball. The other one kind of, dislikes baseball and will immediately the next morning say, mom, will you show me the highlights? I just want to watch the highlights. Right. It's fair. That's fair. I, I feel you on that. I feel you on that. But there, I mean, some of these games, you know, you, you try and get some of these ADHD kids, ADHD kids to do anything. And you, you mean to tell me that they got to sit down and watch a three and a half hour baseball game where 90% of the time nothing happens. That's not, that's not happening. It's not happening. And my poor kids are like, what why is why what and i'm like shh let mommy enjoy the game you know it's it's one of those things and so uh you know savannah bananas banana ball it's a whole different game but right. you want to talk about bringing fun back into the game they're they're doing it right yeah and the game that i brought her to we got no hit <laughs> oh no yeah even worse. <laughs> wait <laughs> i took her to the statue of liberty i thought she was gonna jump in the water was was hobby on the mound <laughs> Who was it what? The he was. Was he it was, was it the Christian Javier game? <laughs> yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. Oh. Javier was on the mound. Oh. We didn't hit shit the whole day. <laughs> and I brought her. I, okay. I looked at her. I said, can we please, we'll go get Joe's pizza downtown. She loved it. We loved it. We went and saw the Statue of Liberty. And I looked at her and said, can we maybe go to another game? And Absolutely not. She, she goes, I mean, if we have to. I'm like, all right. Well, I took her. I ended up taking her to the game. I don't know how I got her there. And I guess that's why she's getting married to me. And so we go to the game and they hit a home run. I think I can't remember who hit the home run, the Yankees. By the time. So we were getting to our seat. We did not see the home run. We were like on the concourse. We finally reached our seat. They didn't get now one single hit the rest of the game. So we watched nine innings of baseball of the Yankees just wetting the sheets doing nothing losing and the best thing they did all day in that no hitter was joey gallo flying out to the track in right field and then the next day they got it they had a home run in the third inning and from then on when we got to our seat they had zero hits and one on an air <laughs> this Sick is no baseball game. this is no disrespect to your fiance but is she just bad luck for the yankees maybe <laughs> You should take her to more games. I'm just, you know. <laughs> so, I don't need to. We haven't won a World Series since I was a, a middle schooler. I'm almost 30. So we have plenty of bad luck. I'm not sure where it's coming from. I would assume it's our GM. But <laughs> I can't. I don't, I don't spend as much time anymore complaining about the Yankees because I'm considered the negative fan. But I, I don't know. I don't know what how much positivity I can do as well. I'm just an observer at this point. I, I will bring some actually Yankees positivity on this podcast, which we are not Yankees fans, obviously, right? I mean, no, not Yankees fans. I'm trying to, but but one of my favorite things I always do on our podcast, like what my favorite things in baseball for the week, um, Harrison Bader, Aaron Judge, and Anthony Volpe, at the, they went to a basketball game, didn't they? Or was it a hockey game? It was oh, something. Oh, my gosh. So they put them all on the screen. You know, Bader's got some swag. You know, Judge is, 
he, you know, big wave in, and then Volpe just kind of like, just like little small wave, just awkward wave. And I was like, I think I like Anthony Volpe. I said this. Oh, so you like that low key, that low keyness of Anthony Volpe? No, I think I like it because he still looks like a small fish, big pond, right? He's like a little fish in a big ocean because he's just like low key, just swimming, doing his thing. But he's still looking at these guys. He's just like in awe, right? Right. And then right. like seeing seeing the picture um, of him like in Derek Jeter, I was like, he's living his dream. And I think that's why I'm kind of a little bit emotionally attached to Anthony Volpe. Yeah, I love how you're like he's this. He looks young. He's all this. He's all that. Jeter had that same thing. I'm sure. I'm sure Volpe will be dating some supermodel in about six years. And that. Hey, so Derek <laughs> Jeter. I actually, I had this conversation the other day. Um, I don't remember who it was with, but I was like, "Look, I was. I just gave, I probably gave this kid horrible advice. I'm pretty sure it was one of my students. Um, I was like, you got to live the life like Derek Jeter. You can date all the hot women, but never get married." He didn't even get he didn't get oh. married he didn't get married until after he retired I don't think like that's, he lived, that's correct he lived the superstar life well I mean what so don't uh, ever come to me yeah. with relationship advice yeah well no I mean but it's good advice though it's good advice because if he, you know had had Derek Jeter in that time the biggest star in baseball gotten married how many how many women would he have cheated on his wife with right like. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that he would, would cheat. Like, he probably wouldn't. You know, I don't know. So, basically, but, he was being respectful? Was he being respectful? Yes. He was yes. being realistic. He, exactly. He was being realistic. Because, how, literally, like, how many women, all the away, all the away games, how many women just going to show up at his hotel room? I guarantee you, there, there are stories. They're literally there are probably lining up at the door. Multitudes. So, you know, he's, he knew, he knew what would happen. He's being smart about it, Shelby. Um, do you want to talk about the other New York team? Because I feel like Gary's probably got a take on a on Mad Max. <laughs> so uh, did you see? Did you see the uprising of Mad Max? Yeah. So you're talking about the the pine tar thing, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but I think I like he like came in his post game interview. He was like, "I swear on my child," and I was like, oh, "Okay." With it. And I well, think every, he said that he said that on the mound too, though. And then, but nah. he said that on the mound too. Yeah, so nah. what's kind of what's kind of <laughs> I want to know kind of your take on that. Like, what I mean, gets tossed, obviously, freaks out, doing Mad Max things. Well, this is this is what I'll say. If I'm in a situation, because I can only speak from what I would do. If I was in a situation where I had just used pine tar as a pitcher. Obviously, I'm doing it for a competitive advantage. And at the very least, I think that enough people around me, enough pitchers around me, are using this technology or this little system that I've got that I think I can get away with it. It'll help me be more effective in the game, whatever. Once I got caught, I think the first thing I would say, especially if I knew I was lying, was that I swear. That's the first thing that any liar will tell you is how much they swear and what they'll swear on. If someone's telling you the truth and like if someone says you're lying and you're telling the truth, you'll just say, I'm not. That's the way someone who looks like they're telling you the truth, they'll just very precisely tell you no or yes I think, very easily. I think where I'm having a tough time with it because I don't really know what to think with Max Scherzer, but we just saw earlier in the week, what is it, Domingo German, the uh, German, pitcher yeah, for the Domingo Yankees? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, we just saw the umpires just kind of blow it off, right? Like, hey, right. go wash your hands. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where I'm having a tough time with it. Like, it's, it's an ump show right now to me because you can't make a rule and not enforce it. It's got there can't be a gray area when it comes to sticky stuff because we we've, we've seen guys like he I should not speak his name but Trevor Bauer, you know he comes out on his YouTube channel, uh, you know he does the thing where he's like hey is this sweater rosin or is it a you know pine tar or whatever oh where he was sticking to his hand yeah and it was sweat and rosin but, I remember that video yeah but it's like mm -hmm. 
they have to come out and say a sticky substance is a sticky substance. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what it is. If you have something sticky on your hand, it's a no-brainer. You're out of the game. So I, I don't like the gray area. We've seen it in this last week. So I, well, I, I, I'm having a really, I was having a really hard time with the Scherzer thing, to be honest. My whole thing was with that was Domingo Herman's spin rates were through the roof in that game. Through the roof. And the game before, he got blown up. I mean, couldn't get out of couldn't get out of the second. I want to say first couldn't couldn't get out of one of the super early innings. Got blown up, and then you mean to tell me from one start to the next, like you're you're gonna get that much better? Like he had been rolling. I think he struck out seven or eight in a row or something like that. And then after he after he'd washed his hands and whatnot, spin rates were down. I wouldn't say significantly, but enough to make a difference. But that's just it with Max. The spin rates weren't up. Right. So I don't I, I don't understand what, like, what, I don't know, What's ticked the rule? them off, like, flagged them or whatever. Like, if that's what the, if that's what was, like, the main, the, the, the line to kind of figure, figure that out. And then after, after he washed his hand, like, spin rate didn't change. So... The uh, but the I'm um, saying that uh, that their ha- that their hands were so sticky for a couple innings afterwards. I'm just like I, what? So no, it's no. Just see, a, it's Suz- Susie Shelby, let me tell you something right now. Domingo Herman is not a good pitcher in Major League <laughs> Baseball. Yeah, I I feel like that should go without saying. But for people who don't watch the Yankees every day like I do, I could tell you right now, Clark Schmidt pitched really well today. Domingo Herman pitched well last time he was out there. Those are two pitchers who are not good pitchers. Okay. Those like, we're talking about consistently effective. I don't right. mean they're a terrible baseball player, nothing crazy like that, but being consistently good. Okay. They're not those things. So in my opinion, in order to get a clear and concise application of this rule, no pine tar, some pine tar, you wash your hands, you're ejected. And it's all up to interpretation of the umps. And like you said, Shelby, umpire show. Yeah. In my opinion, Susie, you mentioned spin rate. Spin rates spiked for one player, another player, they were very similar. In my opinion, in order to get this rule to be sensible, is to have somebody say, okay, this guy, we instead of choosing to check someone for pine tar every inning and making it look like a sideshow that we have to laugh about, Because frankly, I thought it was funny for like 10 days and then I was done with it. Have somebody look at spin rate the entire game. If it becomes a problem, someone's fastball is 2,500 RPMs and then the next inning, their fastball is 3,500 or some other other otherworldly number that does not match who they are, then you throw up the flag. What's the issue? Let's go check him. If someone is putting up numbers that they normally would never put up, now we have an issue. But if someone's using pine tar and their fastball spin rate is the same as what it normally is, why do I care if he actually has pine tar or if he does not? It shouldn't matter. So in my mind, if someone's not getting an advantage spin rate wise, they're really just getting an advantage in terms of control. That's not a problem. That's not the reason we ban the pine tar. That's not why we got rid of the pine tar. We got rid of it so that guys can't throw wizardry sliders. Like that's really the point. So yeah, if Domingo Herman all of a sudden goes from getting shelled three times in a row to coming out, like Susie said, and people are like, our our fingers are sticky after touching the guy for a, a few innings. Okay, well, if that's the case, then he probably shouldn't be pitching again in the game. But if somebody else has the same numbers, why do I care? Because Max Scherzer's dominant anyway. I don't care if he's using pine tar. That's my thought. Yeah. I, don't, I actually, I think that's an interesting take because it's just like subject to search, right? And that's all it is, it's subject to search. Um, and with all the data and analytics and stuff like that, why can't there be some, you know, somebody who sits in the office in New York or at the stadium that's like, hey, you know, we, we, we got to check this guy out. There's some fishy numbers. But then now that's more of a hold accountable, right? Because these guys are professionals. They know what they should and should not be doing. So I, I actually, I'm, I 
I don't disagree with that. I think that's a really good way to kind of take the gray area away. Um, and, and I think that's another way that we can hold those guys accountable. And you're going to see consistent offenders if that's the rule. You're going to you're going to see who's constantly, you know, trying to bend the rules or trying to um, push the limits there. So I haven't I heard that know, one yet. I like that. I need to know what kind of umpire training goes into sussing stuff out like this, though, because that was that was another thing that that had come out, that there was that there was umpire training and right. it was deemed too sticky to just be rosin and sweat. I'm all, so are you telling me that like in the off season, these umpires are going to some sort of like sticky school to where they're going to, they're going to mix, I don't know, like sunscreen and rosin or spider tack and like, and, and now you're going to sit there and tell me that they're going through all this and be like, okay, now, now you're going to have to tell me how sticky this is and what substances these are like, Come on now, like that's. It's not like me. they're a pol- they're training them like police dogs. Yeah, like that's not that's not it. I'm thinking about in my mind, like as you're talking about that, Susie. I'm thinking about Napoleon Dynamite. You know, when he like drinks the milk, he was like, "This one has a hint of copper in it," and that's <laughs> what I'm thinking about as they're going through. Yeah. I don't know why I started thinking about that. Well, and, that movie's old you... school at this point. God, really classic. It's so good though. But I mean, like you would think that at some point that there'd be like, okay, here's. Here's this thing that we can swab on your hands, and if it turns blue, there's something else besides spider tack and, and sweat. You know, like, I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure the science is out there. I don't know if the money is out there for it, but but ultimately, I think this issue goes back to the MLB and how much they want to, to control slash not control. Because honestly and really, if they wanted to get rid of the whole spider tax sticky substance thing they could like npb the japanese league literally has a ball that has a grip that is universal they don't so they don't have to mess with any of this right they don't have to mess with rods they don't have to mess with like there is no none of this the ball is universal and it's it's tacky to begin with and it's not changing season to season like mlb likes to do and i don't know like messing with the weights and messing with how high the seams are like You know, and, you know, players have come out and said, yeah, no, this, these balls, these balls feel like pool cues, pool ball, pool, what's the word I'm looking for? I I know, I mean, I know what you're trying to say, but I don't don't know what they're saying. Cue ball. I know exactly what you're saying. I just, I don't know what it's called either. Yeah, cue ball. I'm glad that I've, I've confounded everybody now. Everyone's Yeah, and that's actually what I was hearing too, is that's how it was feeling like yeah. no one could really get a grip of the baseball. And this is what I would say. If Japan, if I can go to the toilet in McDonald's and put my iPhone, I learned this on TikTok this week and put my iPhone in this machine and will drop down and clean my phone and it will pull it back up. If they can do that with technology, I'm absolutely positive. Rob Manfred and major league baseball can figure out a way to gauge how someone's rpms are rising how they're dropping and if there's a red flag someone walks over to the umpire in between innings says you need to go check this guy yeah something is wrong because frank if someone's spin rate is not out of control i don't think anybody cares what they put on their hand because clearly whatever there's on their hand is not working that's the upside is your spin rate so if the spin rate is not anything crazy then you're going to get hit anyway. Yeah. Well, and you mean you you mean to tell me that this in the entirety of this game that there is not a better way to quote unquote ready the balls, hey now, that like besides magic mud that you get from a secret mud pit in New Jersey or something like that. I'm like really? Really with all of the scientific advances we have? the the one secret mud pit in new jersey and and some motherfucker like in the stadium just rubbing but like you, that's that's the best that we can do come on now there's there's you gotta fi- you gotta figure out a better way to, to to do this i mean but i would be sad for all the ball rubbers not having jobs anymore so you know whatever it would affect the american economy because we'd lose jobs and then we would kill a family business basically there we that's <laughs> Yeah, the Kardashians would no longer be able to uh, mud our balls. <laughs> <laughs> you fit oh, right in, Mary. 
anytime you want to come back, just come on back. Of course. I'm, I'm actually I'm actually really mad at the Kardashians right now because they took Bad Bunny from me, but that's okay. That's a pop culture story <laughs> for another day. Um, okay, I do want to get some of your takes. Um, so l- let's talk about some league wide things. Um, who is your personal sleeper pick? Who should people be watching? Guys kind of flying under the radar, and you're like, hey, this guy's probably going to be pretty good. Who we need to start paying attention to? Oh, players. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sitting here. I'm looking at my phone right now at some of these teams, and I've got to say, Corbin Carroll. No, oh, stop it. We so okay. I'm wearing a pirate's hat right now because it's uh-huh. fun. I got I got forced on a on a pirate strain for reason long story but we are huge diamondbacks fans it started last year really? right mm-hmm. yeah. yes so i'm actually watching the padres and the diamondbacks right now before you came on no shit i said god corbin carroll just looks majestic He's i love corbin carroll we yeah. love corbin carroll so good pick we approve bourbon and baseball approve pick yeah i was gonna yeah. say you guys are d-backs fans there definitely is some bourbon in there you guys are definitely drinking something. There's something in your cup because I'm a deep. I'm here in Arizona, actually. I don't know if you guys knew that. Oh, I did wow. not know that. Yeah, I live here. Oh, we're in Arizona. So I'm forced to be a fan of the Arizona Diamondbacks, but now it's becoming sexy oh. to actually support this team, and it's good because they're setting a, the right precedent by getting rid of guys that they know that are highly paid and just say, "This guy sucks." He sucks, and so, Madison he's a dick. At, at Madison Bumgarner. He's a so, dick. Okay, that's, so, I, I, that, that's one thing I heard. I heard he's a clubhouse cancer. Yeah. Awful. So, Gary, again, I was not a baseball fan before 2018, right? Did not know anything about baseball. Started watching baseball, and I only know this, this Madison Bumgarner. I only know five plus era madison bumgarner i went i went back and started watching old world series and i started watching the 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 giants world series and i was like i'm i'm sorry what now what madison bumgarner was a giant he was good what do you mean he was good his his stats flashed on the screen i'm all i no this is not this is not the madison bumgarner this is not the madison bumgarner i know like Madison Bumgarner has like a five ERA. Are you kidding me? And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I was doing it for a uh, react video, but it was like an honest, it was an honest reaction. And everyone that sees this is like, Susie, you are the stupidest person on earth. I'm all, look, if you, if you didn't know that, like if you didn't watch baseball in that era, you wouldn't know, like you wouldn't know that Madison Bumgarner was the most amazing postseason pitcher pretty much ever. And I was like, look, am I wrong though? Am I wrong? Like, you see this, you see this Madison Bumgarner, and you're, you mean to tell me that that's, that's the same person? You know, like he's only what, 30, 32, but I'm pretty sure that arm is like 73. Yeah, so. no, that's correct. You know how I would describe Madison Bumgarner? He is, if you're coming up, let's just say you're our age, okay? I assume that's, since you know you guys. That you, that you think I'm your age. I love that. Yay. You have to be. You know, you know. <laughs> I'm um, 40, but you know, I'll take you're it. You're pretty much my age. <laughs> Because I'm 30. So this is what I'll say. Madison Bumgarner, for someone that's our age, it's like someone our age listening to Madonna. (laughs) Madonna today looks like a 65-year-old lizard, (laughs) extraterrestrial that we found on the side of Mars. And she sucks at making music. Okay? She sucks. She's horrible at everything. Poor entertainer. She can't sell tickets. And she looks terrible. Okay? She's she's hit the trifecta. Now, someone who's my mother's age listens to Madonna and says, boy, she sucks. But when she was doing Like a Virgin and all these other classics that we listen to at our water parks today, <laughs> she was amazing. Yes. She was excellent. She was the best entertainer. She was the hottest ticket. Madison Bumgarner was Madonna. And yeah. till 
he really became Madonna of today, which is a shell of himself. He is just a nothing. He wouldn't be in the industry had it not been for what was. And I wish I could say that I felt sorry for him, but because I normally feel sorry for any major leaguer, I, I want all of them, frankly, to make as much money as possible. This is a business and it affects their family. But once he's been taken care of, he has enough money for not only himself for the rest of his life, but anyone he cares about. Yeah. But he is just a dick. Yeah. He's not nice. There's and, there's no way that he's going he's going and 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 telling the young pitchers, hey, let me let me come help you. All right. Like let me let me give you a little advice. There's there is none of that. Which is literally going on. probably what he was getting paid for to do, right? A majority of his paycheck. Yeah. The I mean, this is not the most experienced team, right? Like Alec Thomas, you know, Jake McCarthy, Corbin Carroll. They brought in Evan Longoria, you know, things like yes. that. He was there for the staff, and he literally just – if he no, just he, could have just given some words of wisdom, he probably wouldn't have been DFA'd. Yeah, which, to be clear, is the Diamondbacks' fault. You should have probably – you have to vet people before you give them a job. Right. This is an interview, and I know it seems difficult to understand for a lot of people, but we're in podcasting. Other people do other jobs. These people are hired the same way. They try to tell you what they're worth. They want to make more money. They bring you in for an interview. They make an offer. They accept an offer. The Arizona Diamondbacks should have came to Madison Bumgarner and said, we're giving you $20 million a year, essentially for four or five seasons. Are you willing to coach these young guys? Because if not, we're getting the fuck rid of you. Right. Well, if the and- answer is no, then we'll find somebody else to do it. We'll go yeah. hire. We'll go get Wade Miley to go do this job. But they didn't do that. They just got caught up in the name and what he's done, and that's a mistake. But yeah. the good news is they just said, fuck him, get rid of him, and we'll, we'll, we'll let these young guys dollars. just step in. They're pitching well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I and, know. One, you know, one of have... our face, Dre Jameson, was on the bump today. He's not doing great, but yeah. ugh, love that guy. Well, and we have we have fun, fond thoughts about the D-backs anyways because, you know, Brent Strom, our beloved pitching coach, went over there. Um, and you know, for a time we're like, maybe, maybe, maybe Brent, Brent Strom can fix him. If Brent Strom can't fix you, you done. Like, yeah. Poor Dallas Keuchel. I just thought that maybe Dallas Keuchel had a chance when, you know, D-back signed up for like a, a week or whatever. Nope. Brent I just Strom's golfed like, mm. with Dallas Keuchel. Did you? Yeah. What? Amazing guy. Yeah. Okay. Lives like right off the road. Out Great guy. Gosh, yeah. I remember sitting in Keiko's corner. I think I did at one point. And in Keiko's corner, they used to give you like a t shirt and a beard. And you would sit in Minute Maid and you had your fake <laughs> yeah. beard. That, man, that was some special times. That's when tickets were like $12 to sit in the lower. Yeah. Gosh. And but, the lower um, yeah. But no, and then the the D backs too. I mean, like people are starting to rally around them. I'm watching the I'm watching the I think it was the Dodgers game last week. KD's freaking sitting right next to the dugout. <laughs> like, yeah, what is this? Mm-hmm. But yeah, totally love the Serps. Um, I do want you to hit on um, before we kind of start wrapping this up. Um, I do want you to hit on on the Yankees in the AL East because right now, um, it's exactly what we expected, right? Jays 13 and 9, Yankees 13 and 9. We knew it was going to be a hustle this year. So kind of what are your early takes on the on the race? Well, I know like off rip. If you look at the standings, you're going to see the Rays at 19 and 3. I know no, half the baseball fans just have their underwear in a bunch because they'll say, "Well, they didn't play anybody." I'm like, "Well, your fucking team didn't play anyone either, and your team is 10 and 11." So it's like it's hard to win baseball games. Yeah. It is hard. It doesn't matter who you face because if it wasn't, we would all just pull all our money out of our bank accounts and put all of our money on good teams to beat bad teams every day, but it doesn't work. And that's the reason Vegas is a, is an empire because that's how hard it is in sports to figure out how many good teams are going to beat bad teams. It's actually difficult to win those games. So yeah, I look at the Rays and say they are formidable. I don't care who they've played. It matters that they have played 22 games and won 19 of those. That's impressive. Yeah. But 
I've been telling people since before the season started, the most dangerous team, it's not the Blue Jays, the Red Sox obviously suck, but the Orioles. The Orioles are the team I'm looking at because as a Yankees fan, I can't just hyper-focus and think that this team is the only team that exists. I have to look around baseball and think, not just the Astros outside of division, who we're going to see potentially maybe in an ALCS or ALDS situation. But when I look at the Orioles, they're a team who has not spent yet. The Red right. Sox are spending $200 million. So I know when Shohei Otani and some of these players become available, I know the Boston Red Sox are not going to be banging down anyone's door with these offers. They barely could take care of Xander Bogarts. Or no, they couldn't take care of him. He's gone. And Rafael Devers, they can barely take care of him. Yeah. So I know they're not a real long-term threat. When I look at the Rays, I know they're not getting in on Shohei Otani or any of these other upgrades. I know that they're either going to develop a guy or he's not coming. Yeah, That's the they, type of team they are. Do they really need to spend on Shohei Otani? I mean, they just, I don't know what don't. sort of black magic arm factory they have down there. <laughs> well, but I mean, then, it's just like, you know. Literally. It's... Uh, Jeffrey Springs goes down. Yeah. And they're like, let's insert Taj Bradley. Here you right. go. You're not you're like, where did you come from? What? You know? It, it's, it's sick. It's it really is sick. And then, you know, just hitting on the rays really quick, I think it's really helped. We've got to see Wander Franco, right? I mean, he he's mm -hmm. he's kind of right. he's he's really performed. He's everything we expected him to be. And I think that's been huge for that program. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's been fantastic. And I tried to use Wander Franco as an example for Anthony Volpe. People were just shitting bricks about Volpe's slow start. I told guys he's played 10 games. Volpe has played 10 games at that point. And Wander Franco was probably the worst baseball player I've ever seen in my entire life. The first half of his rookie season, he was terrible. But the Rays understood, well, we've developed this guy. We know exactly who he is. We've seen it. We don't need to send him down to AAA to have him prove again why he should be up here, just let him play. And once you let a young guy understand, I'm not going anywhere regardless of how I play, you can start to relax and say, let me show what I do. Eventually it's gonna come out, you start to settle in, and now we see a generational superstar that we call a bargain on a hundred and some million dollar contract. Fantastic deal all around. And but again, the reason I chose that Oriole team, the Orioles haven't spent a dime on anybody. Yeah. And they're a team I know is aggressive because they were in on Carlos Correa. Players like that, they've been in that, oh, well, we'll take on that $300 million player. Well, the Orioles are 14 and seven ahead of New York right now. What happens next year or what happens at the deadline if the Baltimore Orioles decide, let's go get Shohei and then this offseason, We'll lock them up long term. Okay, well, the Baltimore Orioles are already a problem. And that's only bringing on maybe even one player. They're going to bring on multiple players. They're telling us how aggressive they're trying to be. And they believed in Rauschman and all these guys and Rodriguez on the bump. They've got plenty of guys over there in terms of young players. And they're aggressive financially. So a team I'm looking at long term. Tampa can probably still beat the Yankees in a playoff series. It wouldn't shock me. Boston's not really a threat. Toronto, I can't really see them as a threat either. But yeah, I'm a little worried about Baltimore, and I've always been worried about Tampa. Uh, I'm really glad you brought up the O's because, yeah, Gunnar Henderson, Grayson Rodriguez, Adley Rutschman, like that's the future of that organization. Um and I, and, I, and I think we kind of sleep on them. But look at the sleeper teams this year. You see what I'm wearing, right? The Pittsburgh Pirates. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had an awesome, awesome guy on last week, uh, Michael, the Fort McHenry. He uh, uh, broadcast for the Pirates, and we got to kind of talk about them. So I got thrown into the Pirates um, early in the season. We had basically like a draft. Um, and we had to spin a wheel, and then whoever we chose, whoever, you know, we had to follow them for the year. Well, I got thrown with the Pirates. Um, and, you know, I say thrown because I don't think anybody expected the Pirates to be doing what they're doing. And they've won like six in a row. Um, yeah. the, the Diamondbacks, you know, we had um, I remember having Dallas Braden on and I'm talking about um, pumped about the Diamondbacks, pumped about the Diamondbacks. 
He was like, you can't be pumped about the Diamondbacks. They're going to be do the same stuff they always do. Look at what the Diamondbacks are doing. But yeah. I, th- I think we really forget about the Baltimore Orioles. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, I do want to talk to – I guess Susie's internet cut out again. Um, I'm sure she'll shoot me a text here. Um, you know, we don't – again, we don't love the New York Yankees. I do love Anthony Volpe. So I'm just going to speak that into existence right now. But we have this magic, right, um, that we were talking about on this podcast. So last year, the team that I picked to watch – that was going to be a threat at the early in the year was the Seattle Mariners. Look at what the Mariners did last year. Diamondbacks, we get on the D-backs train early. Look at what the D-backs do. We get on the Pirates train. Look at what the Pirates are doing. So I don't know if the magic's going to happen for your Yankees or not, but, it won't. you know. <laughs> it won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You could be four for four with your predictions. I'm here to tell you right now. It's not happening. But the thing is about the Yankees is like, they're going to be a good team. They're still going to be good. It's hard to be good, but we're just a good team. The Yankees still are good. They'll eventually, they'll get somewhat healthy by October. They'll get into the ALDS. They may or may not win that series. They'll have absolutely no chance whatsoever in the ALCS, just like always. And that's our ceiling. Well, that's not good enough. Maybe that's good enough if the Baltimore Orioles made it into an ALDS situation and exit. That's okay because their expectations are on a different level than the Yankees. They're spending different. They're taking their time trying to develop players. And if that's your mentality, you have to change where your sights are. But the Yankees are a team that's spending $265 million. Making it to the ALDS shouldn't tickle my fancy. That's not successful. Successful is doing what the Houston Astros have done the last couple of years, which was win. So regardless of if you want to talk about buzzers and wires on someone's butt cheeks, arms, elbows, and they knew they knew what pitches were coming and all this. Well, evidently the Yankees need to be doing something to get an edge to get to that position, because at this point, You can only become really like a fan of the Astros as a Yankees fan at this point, because I'm not going to sit here and whine about the Astros and how they've cheated their way all the way there. I'm like, you guys really think Astros players are cheaters and none of our players are doing anything at all to take an advantage. It would be a little silly. Um, I think you just gained a lot of respect from Astros Twitter. Because I, I know I know they shit on you quite a bit, and I don't really know why. I haven't seen it yet, but I know you have some pretty hot takes uh, sometimes. But um, I, th- I think it's really nice hearing it, too, from somebody else outside of our own community. Because, I mean, really all we hear from everybody else is cheater. It doesn't matter what happens. Like, you know, Jordan Alvarez, dude wasn't even on the 17 team. Every time he hits a home run, cheater. <laughs> that has nothing can you, to do can with you name me a, a- is there, is there, is it really like when you say that people say Astros are cheaters, right? Right. They'll say this is from all fan bases, right? It could be Marlins, it could be Mets, it could be anybody. And they'll say, you guys cheated to get your way there. There'll be a Cubs fan that will say that. And then you'll turn around and say, how often have you written a 300? Because people will write me a, a novels in my DMs. These are Astros fans. These are Braves fans saying, this team cheated. This guy cheats. Altuve is a cheater. Meanwhile, they're a Cubs fan or uh, someone else. And I'll say, well, did you write this same type of energy for Sammy Sosa or for any other player that we have found out to be cheating? No. We only care when the people that beat us cheated. That's the only time we hold anyone accountable. It's the only time we care about pine tar. It's, it's it. And if Garrett Cole was caught with pine tar the same way Max Scherzer was, people would have their underwear in a bunch. But then if Max Scherzer does it, maybe they they still freak out because he's a great pitcher. But when Domingo Herman does it, no one cares. Somehow, some way. Yet it's the same thing. So I've always said, if you want to devalue what somebody else has done, chances are it's because you're not doing what they're doing. 
and not anything to do with cheating or any else, any really anything else. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, I think that's, I think you hit the nail on the head. And like, my thing is too, like, obviously like my super hot take is like, no matter what, with the steroid era, right. You have to hit a round thing with a round thing and you have to be on time to do, to, to do the big things. But that that's right. my, you know, I, I always say that and my dad's on the, on the same train. And then my stepmom absolutely, ha- absolutely hates that. She's like, it doesn't matter. It's cheating. I'm like, you don't understand everything that has to go into it. But, um, let me tell you something. Um, I have a hell of a lot of respect for you. Thank you so much for coming on today. I think you had some awesome takes. Um, uh, I really enjoyed talking with you. This was an awesome conversation. And I think that's what makes it makes made this kind of special is this was a conversation and it was easy. It was smooth. Um, you bring great energy and you bring great insight. Um, again, your dad should totally be in the hall of fame. Thank I think you. that's absolutely rid- ridiculous. He'll get there eventually. I don't, we don't, we actually, we talk about it quite a bit. I think he forgets. I don't know if he has Parkinson's uh, or not Parkinson's. What, what is that? Uh, the Alzheimer's. What, what is that? Uh, Alzheimer's. He, he, he forget, forget every time I talk was? to him, he's like, Does he forget how good he was. No, he, he, the way he thinks about it, he thinks I'm a hall of famer. The second I stopped, stepped on the field, everybody knew it. So I don't need the validation of a bunch of writers. He's not trying to devalue writers because writers still are professionals and they're doing their jobs. And I'm the same way. I don't disrespect writers. Do I poke fun at them and say, you know, whatever? Yeah, I'll poke fun of them. But you can't devalue their job just because you don't like the decisions that they make. But do I think that sports writers should be in charge of figuring out if Barry Bonds and where my dad go? No. Barry Bonds and my dad are multi-millionaire celebrity athletes. What in the world do baseball writers have anything to do with that? They really shouldn't. Even me, who's a podcaster, you two are podcasters. We should have nothing to do with where Barry Bonds goes. And you probably can make a much stronger argument that fans of the game of baseball should have more of a say in where they go than the writers because writers deal with them so often that they can get, I guess you can say they can get butt hurt about the way that that player deals with them over 20 years. And me and my dad have noticed that over the course of the years, it's almost exclusive. The players that are not voted for by a certain writer, it's almost exclusively a, that guy didn't like me from for the last 15 years type of deal. And that's a problem. So if the hall of fame is supposed to be a museum for the fans, then Maybe the fans should have more of a say than the writers. I I totally agree because I mean the the, the two that kill me every year is your dad and Billy Wagner. Those are the two that absolutely just eat me up. Um, mm-hmm. But they would they would be first first ballot picks for me. But um, Gary, thank you again um, for taking the time out of your day. Um, hopefully, we can do this again, man. This it, it would be awesome. Um, and look forward to, I know you got some things kind of in the mix. So, uh, looking forward to that. You can definitely, uh, uh, we will listen, rate, review, and like what you have going up and, uh, just, just thank you so much again. You, you, you have great insight to the game and we definitely have a lot of respect for you. No, thank you. Thank you both so much. I, I see Susie still dealing with Wi-Fi issues. My Wi-Fi is terrible. We're in 2023 and no one's done anything about the Wi-Fi somehow, some way. I don't, I don't know what it is, but no, in all seriousness, thank you both so much for bringing me on. I don't, I don't do shows like this just to change public perception of myself. Like people are going to like you or not, but the one thing I respect is the fact that you guys did this show and you guys clearly don't care if people dislike you for a strong opinion. And I feel that nobody in sports, whether it's Twitter or podcasting, should feel pressured to agree or disagree with other people's takes. And I can tell you guys don't have, like you guys hold a similar mentality that I have. And as long as people give me an opportunity to, to speak and explain myself, I always try to give people the same chance. And I'm just glad you both were able to do that to me today. So thank you. Where can, uh, where can the people find you? Can they find your shows? Where can they find you on Twitter, Instagram? Um, well, I'm releasing a podcast soon. Um, I'll have those announcements 
on my Twitter. So if someone wants to follow me, you can just follow me on Twitter at Gary Sheffield Jr. And I'll make all those announcements. But but yeah, um, until then, I, yeah, I can't really explain what it is I'm doing just contractually, I guess. But I am excited. No, it's going to be great, man. Well, um, thanks for listening to another episode of Bourbon and Baseball. Um, we look forward to uh, having some other episodes. I'm ha- I, I, this is the second week in a row I've had to do the outro. I don't ever do the outro. <laughs> so I don't know what it is, but um, thanks for listening. Make sure you like, rate, subscribe, review, only say nice things because, I mean, I don't have feelings, but Susie might. Um, but we will uh, see you next week. Uh, go baseball. <laughs>